Um, Sandy, Brett, and Eric, thank you for being here. Uh, I think maybe we should go ahead and get started and uh, take it away. All right. Well, good afternoon. Um, we are here to talk about diversifying leadership development, specifically UCSF's technology staff leadership development program. Uh, so just before we start, we're a little bit weird and wonderful at UCSF. I want to do a little bit of background on what UCSF is for context. We're the only UC campus in the system that focuses exclusively on health. Um, we have no undergrads. We have graduate level only education in four professional schools, medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, and nursing, and a graduate division that offers interdisciplinary degrees and supports postdoctoral scholars. Uh, we have a big research enterprise. We're one of the largest recipients of NIH funds in the country. And we provide world-class healthcare through multiple medical centers and affiliated hospitals and dozens of clinics across Northern California. We also engage with our San Francisco and Northern California communities through public health, health and science education and job training programs. And we're the second largest employer in San Francisco and the fourth largest employer in the nine county Bay Area. So within this context, we're here to talk about staff leadership development, specifically our leadership development program that's geared towards technologists. Who am I? Why am I here? I'm this guy. Uh, my name is Eric Wieland. I'm in charge of web applications and software development in UCSF IT. And the people that are surrounding me in this picture are the catalysts for creating our technology leadership development program, or Tech LDP. This picture is from our program's first graduation in 2016. I spent my first 15 years in UCSF in the Department of Medicine. And in 2004, I was accepted to the School of Medicine's Leadership Development Program. Um, program was designed to create a pipeline for internal candidates to become division and department managers in the school. And at the time, I was one of two technologists in the program run by this gentleman here, Richard. Um, and then in 2008, I talked my colleague Andres into joining that program, and he became hooked on professional development. Um, by that time, I had started mentoring in the administrative and management professionals, what used to be called ABOG mentorship program. And I talked Andres into joining that program as a mentor after he graduated from the SOM LDP. And he, he and I both served on the steering committee for the AMP mentorship program. So fast forward to 2015, we'd gone through our operational excellence. We were centralized, both of us in um, central IT. And we went to a leadership meeting and tried to talk those managers and supervisors into becoming mentors for the AMP mentorship program. And after the, when we were done with our slides, there were crickets. And my boss said, why don't we just have our own? Um, and so Andres and I got together and we thought about the benefits of both the classroom uh, sessions that we had gone through in the School of Medicine's program, the AMP mentorship portion, and we decided to create our own program, which is now called the Tech LDP. So the Tech LDP is really three things. It's a foundation of a year-long mentoring program. Mentees and mentors mutually match each other. They write up a mentoring agreement with uh, mutual goals. They meet about two to four times a month, and the mentors support the mentees' professional and, and personal growth throughout the program. The next part is learning. We have monthly classroom sessions where leaders share their stories. We have uh, mixed professional skills development like Clifton Strengths, public speaking, Lean and A3 thinking, uh, communications and storytelling, among other things. And then finally, what we do is we take the Clifton Strengths um, of all of the different mentees and we form them into project teams of four. And we ask them pick a project that's either related to technology or technologists and use a, a lean method and come up with a proposal to leadership on how to solve that problem. And they give their capstone presentations uh, at the end of the, of the, the year. Um, so this is open to staff and technology roles. It's both represented and unrepresented staff, uh, grades 17 through 27, and all the usual HR requirements like minimum of one year of service, at least a 50% appointment, and a satisfactory performance rating. Now, when we started this, uh, Andres and I, we pitched this to leadership. And the first thing our CIO said was, I want to be open to every technologist at UCSF. So at the time, Central IT was about 300, but there were about 1,200 technology staff across UCSF. And we said, can we please fail, fail quietly first, and then we'll try to expand it. So we got buy-in from leadership that we would build and iterate and try to make it a better program. And then we add as we go. 
So here's what that has looked like for us. Uh, 2016, we started with um, a, a group of 150 eligible people. We had a cohort of 12, same thing in 2018. Um, the class of 2019, we expanded to include our health IT, um, our uh, BCH Oakland, our Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland, our health informatics cap folks. And we also raised the uh, eligibility grade cap from 25 to 26. So this increased our uh, eligibility pool by a significant amount. So we added more people to the cohort as a result. Uh, 2021 hit and we uh, added in uh, remote participation for obvious reasons and raised the grade cap to 27. And so that increased our eligibility to 330. So we decided to raise the cohort size again. Then 2023 comes along and our, our leadership says, we wanna add way more people, everyone in our finance and administrative services, library, radiology, all over the place. So we doubled the, the uh, number of eligible people. And now what? So eventually we're gonna get to 1200. Um, the number of applications has been increasing each year too. So what do we do? We just keep expanding the cohort size. That's it's not so easy to do. The committee members like me and Brett and Sandy, we're all volunteers and our time is finite as are the time of our leaders and our presenters. And so how do we uh, make this increasingly popular program within reach of the staff who need it? At the same time all this is going on, um, we had started introducing DEI into our program. So we started adding topics like unconscious bias, microaggressions, um, diversity leadership panels to our program in the 2019 cycle. Um, and then we had also been doing before the pandemic hit, um, we had an anti-racism committee, we added a DEI champions program, and our HR uh, came up with a hiring best practices program where we look at things like um, everyone on the hiring panel has to have unconscious bias training. We have to have diversity statements for managers. Um, all the team members um, have to go through um, sensitivity training. Uh, we have redacted resume review, diversity and hiring panels, um, requiring uh, scoring rubrics for evaluations of candidates, and also improved outreach to reach more diverse candidates. Um, so we get to the point where we've had all of this information um, coming at us and we're getting ready for our latest cohort. And we looked at our demographics from past cohorts and we saw to our surprise, we actually had a really good diversity in grade level. So how high up in your career you are, years of service and gender identity, but we found a distinct lack of diversity in our ethnic data. And so we were doing the work, but it was time for us to do more. And I'm gonna hand off to Brett now to talk about the next steps. Hey everybody, my name is Brett Gerstenberger. I am the supervisor on the MuleSoft team under integration services at UCSF. I've been with UCSF since 2016 when Eric recruited me to join UCSF. Um, and I happen to be fortunate enough that in that expanded cohort during the pandemic years, they expanded to include remote employees. So I was able to participate in the tech leadership development program as part of the 2021 cohort. And after that, I joined the committee. Uh, I currently serve on the committee where I help spearhead the project subcommittee or the work group that we kind of help facilitate the groups in their, in their capstone project. Um, additionally, I also served in a role of helping to steer the uh, group that looked at our application process and looking for really how we improve it to make it more equitable as we move forward. So Eric, next slide, please. So as we look to expand the program, we really took stock of where we were. We looked at what we were doing well. And you know, as Eric mentioned, we did pretty well in gender, years of service, career levels. But as we kind of dug in, we looked at the ethnicity data and it, and it wasn't quite where we wanted to be. For example, in 2019, a white applicant had a 56% chance of being accepted, while Hispanic and black applicants had 20% or 25% respectively. In 2021, Hispanic applicants had an increased likelihood, but it came at the expense of our Asian applicants. So if we really are serious about promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, it was pretty clear to us that we had some work to do in this area. And next slide. Additionally, as we kind of dove into the application process, how it previously worked, we uncovered another area for growth. So the application process review at times was subjective, and it really came down to how people were ranking the candidates and how the final decisions were made. 
there are times where the scoring was so close that the committee debated who should get the final spot. This led to the decision being more about who the candidate knew rather than the merits of the application. As we look to expand the tech leadership development program, this methodology is problematic. It lacks transparency and it really introduces bias into the final selections. It additionally, it creates a severe disadvantage to new groups who may not have proper representation on the committee. So we set out on a course to change this. Next slide. And so what we did, well, first we wanted to build diversity into the application process. As we're a program that's deeply rooted in growth, we asked the question to see where people are on their DEI journey. Previously, we relied on HR for demographic data, which at times was limited. So this year we added the option for applicants to self-report the demographic data. We also wanted to standardize the reviewing experience. And like most great ideas, we wanted to borrow from something we knew worked. So we leveraged work that had been done by our UC Tech host campus and used the best practices in hiring from HR as sort of a starting point. We looked to enhance and expand our existing rubric with the goal of really standardizing the scoring across multiple reviewers. So we, we designed a rubric that had specific criteria for each ranking level for each question asked. And then lastly, we really wanted to try and remove as many biases as possible. So we looked to, to de-identify the applications. So we had one volunteer who opted out of the reviewing process entirely and instead focused his efforts on redacting the applications, pulling out all the names of individuals, of teams, of projects, of products, really anything that could help identify an individual. Or simply put, Eric just put the action into redaction. So from here, Eric helped group applications into bundles to ensure that no one read an application from someone who reports up to them or works directly with them. But most importantly, the committee agreed that upfront, all names and roles of applicants were kept secret until after the final cohort was selected. So that solves the problem we talked about a little bit earlier. And then next slide. So in addition to looking at the application review process, we also wanted to enhance our outreach efforts. As we're moving to new groups or new territories that might not have heard this before, we really wanted to have a plan to reach as many people as possible. Historically, committee members recruited applicants by email or word of mouth, maybe talking about it at a water cooler situation. But as we look to expand, we really wanted to diversify our applications. We did this by creating a system systematic outreach plan where we first identified all eligible staff. And when we pulled that data, we included data of, of who their managers are and department, department reporting structures. We used that data to help build a roadmap of where committee members intersected with the new department's management structures. We used department meetings, committee meetings, all hands, really anywhere where, where committee members could meet with department leaders and engage with them. We looked for group sessions where we could interact and share the success of the program and how this program would benefit them and their employees. So as we continue to do this, we hosted a, a series of informational events to talk about the program, talk about the application process, create venues for people to ask questions. One of the things we really tried to do is make past mentees of the program available to answer questions so they could share that one-on-one -on -one experience with someone who's considering it. This allows someone to understand how they could fit and how they could benefit from going through this program. But most importantly, we built a system to help keep track of who, where, and when we, we participated in outreach events. And to quote Jane Wong, if it's not tracked, it didn't happen. And then one of the key things of our learnings is really the rep repetition of following up. So telling people about it, telling them about it again, encouraging them to encourage their people to apply. We did this with leaders, managers, supervisors, really anybody to help drive more people to the program. We promoted this in team meetings. We promoted in teams channels. We offered up the mentees to, to discuss how it fit with them. And we really tried to, to expand the conversation around how great this program is and the benefit it offers staff. Before we hand it off to Sandy, there were a couple of things I just wanna call out that, that we learned. One is the redaction itself led to new challenges. I don't know if anyone's looked at any of the UFO data that's been released by our federal government, but when you redact so many things about who, what, where, and why something happened, it can make it very difficult to read. So that's something we're gonna keep in mind going forward. Additionally, we did add a diversity question and, and, some, and a 
corresponding rubric scoring sheet. But however, we really need to look at that again and enhance it a little bit further to make it more successful as we go forward. And so with that being said, I'm gonna hand it off to, to my friend and yours, Sandy. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I am Sandy Stahl. I'm the Associate Director for Enterprise Information and Analytics. And it's only appropriate for me to present the data for this effort, I suppose. Uh, I've been at UCSF for over 20 years, both in the clinical and the technical role combined. And as mentioned, I'm a committee member and a mentor this year. Um, I was on site prior to the pandemic, um, but have since become fully remote. So I've experienced the program both from various methods um, over the years. And it's a great pleasure for me to share the data and the results of our efforts with you today. Um, but first wanted to start because we really like quotes from our CIO. Um, and we recently presented this topic um, and found uh, that our CIO was really encouraging us to be data driven and drive um, our inner using data to drive our intervention so that we can actually know how we're doing. And, and I do think that that's very significant of us to be able to know if we're really making that difference. So next slide. So first, with our analysis, we analyzed our mentees by their job codes. And as you can see, um, there's a nice standard curve in the distribution between the job grades, which was something we definitely wanted to look at. And the bulk of the mentees were in the mid-level grades, which is characteristic of the folks that tend to be interested in career growth and leadership and representative of what the distribution is realistically like in IT as well. Wanted to just also note that you can see on the right side that there were some grades that were in the hundreds. And that is really just showing the difference between staff that were represented versus not represented, but that they were still there as well. On the next slide, um, we also analyzed our data, our mentee data by gender. Um, now this was self-reported. Um, and I thought what was really interesting is that the um, mentee cohort gender analysis found that more males were eligible and more males applied for the program. Um, but who was accepted ended up actually being just slightly more females. Um, and remember, this was all blinded. Um, so it actually makes me very proud to see that there are more females actually um, being represented in IT. Um, and so I do think that that is really exciting to see. Um, next slide. We then broke it down um, and looked at the diversity of the mentees. And for just this cohort alone, we could see that the percentage of accepted staff were more diversely represented than the pool of applicants. For instance, the eligible staff um, that are of the white ethnicity that represented, you can see 41, about 41% of the eligibility pool decreased to represent about 33% of the accepted cohort. This allowed for that increase in diversity seen in the Latinx and Black ethnicity staff, where you can see representation was smaller in the eligibility pool, but greater representation in the selected cohort. And on the next slide, as a result, uh, in evaluating the acceptance rate over the four years, minus the pause, minor pause that we had for COVID, we were able to provide more equity when uh, evaluating by ethnicity. For example, the likelihood of an applicant of Asian and white ethnicity to be accepted were disproportionately higher than Black and Latinx or Hispanic populations. But um, with the interventions that we implemented, the applicants then all had more equal likelihood of being accepted into the program with that overall acceptance rate of about 42%, which is closer to that goal of equal opportunity. And on that next slide, we actually have a different or another view, similar to what Brett had already showed earlier as well, um, how the color distribution, as you can see, represented the different ethnicities, and they were initially um, unequal, right? Um, but that as we uh, implemented our interventions, you can see on the far right that they're more equally distributed as a result of that work. We created not only a more equitable and standard approach, but we also have the data now to demonstrate the achievement of most of the most diverse and equal cohort in the history of the program. 
So on the next slide is lessons learned. What's next, right? We still feel like we have a long way to go. Um, we are integrating feedback from the various sources that this has been presented, um, both also from our applicants, as well as that internal uh, presentation at a healthcare symposium we presented at and any other venues that we're getting feedback from. Some of the areas that we want to try to actually improve um, are on the outreach side, we plan to conduct analysis on referrals and the effectiveness of the outreach that we actually have so that we can hopefully try to optimize that. Um, with the application process, we want to revise and update our application. Um, the, as mentioned by Brett earlier, we want to clarify the intent behind some of our questions like the diversity statement that was added. It caused some confusion for people who are unfamiliar with the concept, and so we want to ensure that there's a little more clarity and, and that we also provide rubric um, in the applications and that they're in sync with what we actually um, are looking for when we're uh, selecting. Uh, we also want to iterate to increase equity in the application process, of course. Um, other next steps for our selection process, as Brett mentioned, blinding applications was really hard. And having read so many, um, I had to substitute pronouns or words for myself just to keep myself consistent sometimes. We need to really balance a lot of that um, between possibly recognizing the individual, but allowing the experiences to shine through the process. Um, but allowing read readability. Um, we took a more conservative approach uh, by blinding the names and the projects and the accomplishments that might be recognizable, which made it such a hard um, application to read, but we did we did it. Um, and, and I think that what is really great is that the cohort also still was represented um, with, the, with so much diversity as a result. Um, and of course, publishing the process. We have lots of questions from people, uh, including our mentees, of, of course, about why they didn't get into, um, why they didn't get in. And so more communication and transparency to help as well with some folks. Um, and we hope to provide that um, on a more consistent basis in the future. And Regardless, regarding the program alone, we want to start to run analysis on the mentors as well. So, you know, we started with the mentees, but we want to also make sure that we're providing um, equitable um, mentorship and diversity in our mentors as well. Um, so those are just a few of the immediate next steps. But of course, we're always learning, always adapting. And I imagine that we'll have many more iterations to come. Uh, and of course, we welcome feedback from you all as well. Um, so with that, we want to thank you. And, and take this time now to take uh, questions from the audience at this time. Uh, currently, I don't see any questions coming in. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to ask some questions. I think it sounds like a fantastic program. Uh, very exciting. <clears throat> and uh, your last mention of mentor analysis is exactly what I was wondering. If you're going to be able to see uh, in the alumni you're ever kind of um, approaching an equity, right, in the alumni, since you started off balance just a little bit. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is, do you use the alumni as mentors or are, uh, is that, um, is that a, uh, a, a cohort that you leverage much? Yeah, I'd be happy to speak to that. Um... Our goal when we started the program was actually to make it so that the eventually the program was run exclusively by alumni and, and people who weren't involved in the in the creation of it, um, just to have it really focus more on the needs of the people who go through the program. Um, every year we tap alumni to join our program committee. We tap them to become mentors, to encourage their coworkers to apply for the program, um, to come and speak to us. Um, so yeah, it's uh, the the alumni are kind of the the biggest cheerleaders for the program uh, after our leadership, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there was a question uh, earlier. I saw uh, what was it? It was um, oh, when you turn to uh, asking for self-reported data where HR didn't necessarily have it, are you finding that people are um, providing sufficient? Uh, I guess, demographics of themselves. Uh, I remember seeing in the one slide, and I can't remember if the numbers, uh, the undisclosed, if those were significant enough to, to worry about, it looks pretty low. It, it's fairly low. Um, 
we have been getting better data over time from HR, and the only way we can measure ourselves against our uh, success, which is the accepted applicants, is really against the who's eligible. And we can't ask everyone in IT to self-report what their ethnicity is and, and get everyone to respond. So the applicants, we definitely, um, we, we pull it from HR and we also pull the eligible, but then the uh, applicants, we're also asking them to self-report. So we get data that we can compare accepted versus applied at least. Gotcha. And, and what we see is often um, uh, more intersectionality. So not just distinct buckets of I am Asian or I am Hispanic. It's I am mixed race. I am multi-ethnic. Oh, right. Of course. Right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I had uh, another question that came up. I hope you don't mind me asking questions as a <laughs> facilitator, but um, I was listening intently. And um, Brett, when you talked about um, uh, de-identifying uh, applications and that, that led to um, you hinted at it creating a problem, and my first thought was, well, it could become a very bland or undifferentiated application at a certain point if too much is redacted. But anyway, maybe you could be a little more specific about what you, uh, what was the challenge there? Well, so as I kind of alluded to, when you redact a lot, we had people who, who really listed um, some of their accomplishments or key projects. And so if you had done a lot and really listed a lot of what you had done at UCSF that was specific to you, your application may be hindered because so much was redacted that it became harder to read. Um, you know, I just there was a there was a remarkable difference between people who generally talked about things they had done or things they were interested in versus people who put very specific um, examples in. And that's one of the things we want to look at going forward is is we we might have overcorrected and took too much out of some of the applications which might have lessened someone's chance of getting in. And that's something that, that we were we didn't know and we didn't really anticipate until we got the first round of redacted items in. And it's something that we're going to hopefully address and find a more of a happy medium going forward. That sounds good. I'm, uh, it's great that you noticed that and actually have your finger on the pulse of that. Um, so how many do you anticipate uh, in, the, in the next couple of years accepting into the program. I know it looks like it's almost exponential growth. Have you thought about how to manage that? We've actually had um, HR has been asking all the existing staff development programs across the university to find more ways to offer mentorship uh, to more of the staff. And so we've been trying to figure out if there's a way for us to partner with other initiatives. And, and sure enough, there is, as we're um, consolidating IT more and more, we're finding that there's more of these pockets of staff development that we can partner with. And so in health IT, there is a professional mentorship program that is um, separate from ours, but that we're going to start sharing best practices and techniques uh, across both programs so that we can expand at least more mentorship and then have this more concentrated annual program continue to be a little bit more restrictive and, and more competitive. But we will get to the point very quickly where we are uh, every uh, one of the tw approximately 1,200 IT people across the university will be eligible for this program. That's incredible. Good work. Um, I've And I'm going to share this slide just as people are thinking about uh, more uh, things that they want to do. We will obviously share our slides, but um, there is a leadership development Slack channel on the UC Tech Slack, so we encourage you to join. Um, feel free to contact any one of us and we can um, very gladly share any of the information that we've either shared here or just about our program in general. Um, and these are the, this is our website, which you'll see the, it's just techldp at ucsf.edu. But these are the three um, programs that we really drew from when we were creating our program. Ultimately, the faculty mentorship program at UCSF is the, the source of all of our mentoring information used across all these different programs. All right, very good. Um, I'm going to look one last time for any uh, additional questions. I don't see any right now. I want to thank Eric, Sandy, and Brett for sharing this with us. It really is a fascinating program. Uh, congrats on the success and uh, and um, best of luck managing 
<laughs> that, that growth. Um, and for all of our attendees, I want to encourage you to get into uh, in the, the CVENT forum. There is a survey. We would love you to take uh, feedback as a gift that we're looking for um, from you in order to better serve you in the next round. And uh, with that, I thank everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks.